I want to talk about the uh, the structure of the of the pool stage and how it's almost the flip of the coin, if you like, from from four years ago. In many respects, you you do a lot of the heavy lifting at the start now with with Scotland and Japan, and um, that wasn't the case four years ago. Is it more advantageous this time around, in so much as on the first weekend you see obviously 24 hours in advance your potential quarterfinal opponents, and then when you go to play Scotland, you take control of the group based on the result. Yeah, I like the way you say take control of the group. It is based on that result. So there's there's a real sense of pressure this time that we didn't have so much last time. You know, we had Canada, then Romania, then Italy, and the target was always going to be the French because they are so tough to beat at World Cups and, and they have the sort of athletes that make them very tough to beat. So um, this time, Scotland, man for man, if you match the two teams up, we're very similar in the way we match up. Um, and so the, the, there won't be a huge amount between the teams. There won't be any quarter given. Uh, the two teams know each other inside out. So that's complicated enough, but then we have a six day turnaround. Japan have eight day turnaround. They play Russia first, so they'll most likely get a bit of a rhythm and, and be aimed up at us. They'll be able to sit back 48 hours later and watch our match knowing that they've already recovered and, and they're ready to go while we'll be recovering from that, that big hit out that Scotland will be. So um, if we can negotiate those first two games, I'm going to say, yeah, that, that's a good way for the pool to be. If we don't, then, you know, then you're immediately you're in trouble. Which probably leads me on um, fortuitously to the fact that I suppose you're going to have to beat all the teams if you want to get to where you want to be ultimately, which is the, the very high standards you set yourselves. I mean, what is what would quantify success at the World Cup for, for you? Well, uh, I think just getting through that quarterfinal stage, what what this team have managed to do is is set new benchmarks. You know, they've won in the last six and a half years, they've won three quarters of the games that they've played pretty much. Um, they've, they've managed to beat every top team in the world um, more than once. So what we hope to do is, is, is try to galvanise people in as positive a fashion as possible because I, I think sport can do that for people. I don't want to bring the curtain down before the final act because very often we save a lot of the drama for the final act, but obviously um, your chapter this current chapter is, is coming to an end after the World Cup. How would you like people to recall your time as head coach of this Ireland team? Oh, yeah, I, I'd say it's more of a paragraph than a chapter. It hasn't been that long in the context of, of Irish rugby, but uh, you know, I, I think we've just tried to be positive. And um, you know, I, I think players have, um, have, have really enjoyed this period. They've, they've, obviously had some success in this period. Uh, three out of six Six Nations um, getting the Grand Slam, beating the other teams that, that, that were mentioned earlier. But um, even more so, I, I'd, I'd love people to remember it because of just the different moments that have been compiled. Um, and, and some of them are before kickoff, you know. I, I thought that figure eight that the, that the boys did in Chicago, I thought it was really special, especially, you know, knowing Axel, uh, the Munster guys at the front of it. Um, a, again, I, I, I'd like to think that people will remember, capture moments like that. Um, you know, whether it's a, a certain try or a, or a try saving tackle that, that made it a massive difference. Um, and and that, that reflective pride that people can get from having a group of men go out and, and try to do their very best for the, for the jersey that they wear.